palaces, the most spectacular and lavish homes on earth. Luxuriously designed for the royals who wanted the biggest and the best. Behind the golden gates of these royal megastructures are incredible stories waiting to be discovered. Infamous monarchs from history and the artists, designers and engineers who turned their grand visions into a reality. These are the most opulent, flamboyant and innovative royal residences around the world. This time, constructed on the site of a former castle, the Royal Palace of Stockholm has 1,400 rooms, spread over three main floors, and covers almost 300 years of design. From Baroque, through Rococo, to the present day, making it one of the world's greatest palaces. Measuring 230 meters long and 125 meters wide, the Royal Palace of Stockholm may look perfectly rectangular and uniform from the outside, but the rooms within are anything but. Located in the center of Sweden's capital city, the sumptuous palace has been the official residence of the Swedish monarchy for over 250 years. Lars Lundström is the head curator at the Royal Palace. To say what makes Stockholm unique is a, it's a difficult question, actually, because every royal palace, every royal house is unique in its way. The Swedes tend to think of ourselves as a modern nation, and, and, and uh, um, the general picture of Sweden has got a lot more to do with modernity than with history. When you look a little bit beneath the surface. Uh, so very, very much that has been handed down through the generations. And that kind of continuity, although reshaped, steeped in a new way, still characterizes Sweden very much. Kings and queens of Sweden called the royal palace home until 1982, when the current king, Karl XVI Gustav, moved to the outskirts of the bustling city. After the marriage of our current king and queen, their majesties decided that bringing up children would be much more natural in, in a place like Drottingholm than here in the center of Stockholm, which is actually the first time that kings have been permanently living somewhere else than in the center of Stockholm since they started living somewhere permanently at all. It's the king's official residence. And this is where the king and the queen and also the crown princess and her husband has their offices. So every day, or more or less every day, they come in here to do their different kinds of duties. But also this is where all the official ceremonies take place. Like you have state visits, uh, the gala dinners, all those social functions and ceremonies always takes place here at the Royal Palace. Before the Royal Palace was completed in the 18th century, a castle stood on the same site. It was called Tre Kronor, meaning three crowns. Dating back to the 13th century, it is believed that the physical structure of Tre Kronor was made from a hybrid of materials over the years. So the Tre Krona castle, we believe, was primarily made from timber. And we also understand that the roof covering was of copper plates. So even if there were parts of it that were made from stone and brick, it was quite dominated by timber. The original castle had not been built in one period. Like any medieval castle, it had been added to many times before. And by the 17th century, it was a wonderful concoction of different styles and periods. The base of it was stone, the top of the towers was brick, and these were topped out with wonderful spires in copper and of slate. So the whole building was a fairy tale concoction of towers and staircases and turrets. 
By the late 17th century, Sweden was expanding its borders. The ruling monarch, King Charles XI, wanted a new palace that was befitting of the growing nation. At that time, Sweden had become a rather large and important country in the northern part of Europe and felt ashamed of the old palace when people came to Stockholm from the continent. That was not the way a proper castle or modern castle should look at that time. Still very much of the Renaissance style remained and uh, even a lot of the medieval style. So Charles XI started to renovate the old medieval castle and had to rebuild a part of it to become more modern. In that time, they also had a big program where they sent away different kind of artisans and architects to study the latest fashion down in the subcontinent. Now we're talking about Italy and France. So the inspiration was to go to the source, the Silicon Valley of the time, and get inspiration to build something magnificent that would show that Charles XI was the greatest king that Sweden ever had. To realize his dream, King Charles reached out to the finest architect in Sweden. Nicodemus Tissin the Younger was actually the son of an architect who was called Nicodemus Tissin the Elder. Nicodemus Tissin the Younger was born in 1654 and got really heads on like being taught and raised as an architect. There was no other plans for him than becoming the person that would inherit his father's uh, title and education. So his style and the uh, his education to his young youth was actually just focused on becoming an architect. That's why he kind of early also goes in his early 20s to Italy uh, to study architecture on site. When Tessin came back to Sweden, he knew exactly the way a modern palace should look. And this was around 1690. And at that time, uh, King Carl XI had decided to modernize the northern wing of the palace. At the time, Stockholm Palace had two large towers in the northern wing and a smaller building between those two towers. So two apartments were added between those two towers. Completed in the mid-1690s, King Charles XI's gallery was the jewel in the crown of Nicodemus Tassin's new look North Wing. Tassin invited artists, who he had met on a visit to Versailles, to paint the ceilings in the gallery. The murals tell many stories. The main story is about a war between Sweden and Denmark that was taking place in the 1670s. And uh, it's like a story that starts here. This is called the War Cabinet. And this is about how the war are starting. And then the story continues. So we can see that blacksmiths are making weapons. They are making swords up on the painting just up here then. So this is about how the soldiers were armed. And then the story continues very quickly. So there you can see Karl XI. This is about the victory. He's going to be crowned with a circle of stars. And this is a symbol for eternity. So Karl XI would be forever known for his courageousness during these battles against the Danes. If you think about the craftsmanship, it's amazing, this room is quite amazing because you can imagine all the painters working here then, and also sculptors and uh, people that was gilding all the frames. So I think it's amazing when you think about how many people that was working here at the time. The artwork depicting Sweden's 17th century victory over Denmark is part of a proud military tradition that lives on today. Even the current king, Karl XVI Gustav, served in the Navy. And they've kept a great deal of the pomp and ceremony. The Svea Guard, who are the oldest, apart from the Vatican Guard, the oldest regiment in Europe, and they're 
royal blue uniforms and steel helmets still mount guard at the royal palace in Stockholm. The ceremonial changing of the guard takes place at the palace three times a week in the winter and every day during the summer months, attracting 800,000 spectators per year. It's been a tradition since midsummer 1523, and this form, as we see it today, more or less, uh, it's been going on since, since the mid 1700s. They will actually just be waiting now until the, the new guard arrives. And when the new guard arrives, there will be a parade for the banner, the Swedish banner, and then they will start changing the guards. The sentries tell each other what they are supposed to be guarding. So every sentry around the palace has this type of instruction that they are telling the next sentry. And now you see the two guards changing place. So they have the new guard entering the rifle bridge, and that's the position of the acting guard, so to speak. Eighteen years after leading his army to victory against the Danes, Swedish King Charles XI died in April 1697. Just weeks later, a huge fire engulfed Trekronor Castle, the fortress that once stood on the site of the Royal Palace of Stockholm. They had not had the time to organize a funeral yet. When the fire started in the afternoon, they carried his mortal remains. It was the first that they saved, of course, because it was very important to have a proper funeral for the king. So we are quite sure that the first started on the attic and was the Friday, May 7th, 1697. We are not quite sure, though, how the first started, but most probably it was a broken chimney that caused the fire. And there was a fire for almost one week. And uh, when a week had passed, the palace was more or less totally in ruins. The fire was devastating, destroyed all of the castle, apart from the newly built North Wing. The Regency Council of the new king, Charles XII, immediately commissioned a bigger and better palace. They called upon the architect who had revamped the surviving North Wing just a couple of years before the fire, Nicodemus Tassin. A couple of days after the fire, Nicodemus Tassin the Younger, the architect, were asked to make a new plan of a new palace. But he thought um, it's not good to build a new palace on the fire-damaged walls. So the fire-damaged walls were actually demolished then, and then three new wings was built then in the 18th century. Tassin's new plans were a million miles from the fairy tale turrets of Trey Cronor. The easiest way to describe his proposal was that he started off with a northern wing where he had existing walls which could be reused. Then he added three more wings to create a square, like a Roman palace, which was four squared with a yard in the, in the center. And in order to make this look less box-shaped, he then added lower abutted wings on either side. There was a little bit of a problem on the southern side because if you really extended the southwest wing as far as it should, you had to demolish the main church of Stockholm. That was out of the question. And therefore, we've got rounded wings at the outer courtyard that screen off the fact that one wing is just a little stump. In terms of the design aesthetic of this palace, it's actually a fairly low-rise structure of a few stories, and it's very, very geometric, so it's a clean, rectangular sort of shape um, in the Baroque style. The bottom of the palace appears to sit on a stone plinth, and above that we have a band of rendered brickwork with stone surrounds around the windows, and then at the top a cornice and a parapet. So the building's divided like a 
classical column into three parts, a base and then a large area of wall, and then a top, like a capital on a column. Construction of the new royal palace began just months after the fire, in 1697. Nicodemus Tassin and the government decided on using native domestic materials. So a lot of stones were quarried from Swedish stone quarries in Gotland and in other parts of Sweden. At the palace, there would be maybe two or three hundred people working daily from different shifts doing construction work and a lot of bricklayers. The original castle was mostly constructed of stone, which is typical of castles of the period. The new buildings were constructed out of stone and brick. Brick was used for the interior of the walls, which was again normal for the late 17th century. It enabled you to have a fireproof construction and created large walls relatively cheaply. But all the decoration was beautifully done in stone which formed a thin layer on the outside. The brick was covered up by render to protect it from the frost and the weather. The render is a great idea because it has a uniform color, giving a flat facade, but also because when it cracks or becomes damaged, it's easy to replace, which in the harsh climate of Stockholm with the frost attacking the brickwork, meant you had a surface you could continually repair to keep the palace pristine. But the weather wasn't the main problem in constructing the palace. An unsuccessful conflict against Russia in the Great Northern War between 1700 and 1721 created a great financial strain on Sweden. If I'm to give a short answer to how the built went, it's slow. Sweden was engaged in a war. It actually ended with complete defeat and the end of Sweden's rather brief time as a great power in this part of Europe. And all resources had to be put into the war effort just to make the country survive, meaning that the building here grinded to a halt. The Great Northern War was, of course, also a proof of failure of the royal family to keep Sweden to have control of its borders. So when Charles XII dies in 1718, the royal family has a lot of criticism around it for being self-interested. But it actually starts with a, a new era called the Age of Liberty in 1721. And it transcends to the royal family as being symbols of power, but not a head of power. The builders downed their tools for 18 years between 1710 and 1728. By the time the construction of the palace resumed, the architect, Nicodemus Tassin the Younger, was in his early 70s. Nicodemus Tassin the Younger's original plans were, were in style Baroque. So the early interiors that are constructed before the fire are in a Baroque style. And of course, the exterior is also in the Baroque style, which is much more heavier and massive in its architectural expression than what later on becomes the Rococo when the royal family moves in in 1754. So there's a transition between the exterior as being Baroque during this time, when, since it takes around 58 years to construct a palace, that the styles change. So a lot of the interiors through that time become a Rococo interior. Modernity was what mattered when the palace was decorated. This was cutting edge modernity. Long before anyone had heard of Rococo in Germany or in Denmark. So this was a way of showing that you knew what was happening, a way of showing the world that this was a modern nation. We had just lost our status as a great power, and this was a starting afresh. The monarch who finally moved into the new royal palace in 1754 was King Adolf Frederick. But after almost 60 years of construction, things had changed in Sweden. The king no longer had the same power as many of his predecessors. The day when they moved in in 1754 was a big ceremony. 
Uh, it was designed for an absolute ruler of a great power, an extremely big palace, even by that time standards. When it was finished, it was still a symbol of Sweden's greatness, but no longer for an absolute ruler. And it's a parliamentary committee that decides about the building, not the king. The king was a bystander. And then the parliament more or less hands over the, the keys and says, well, please, we are finished now. Architect Nicodemus Tassin the Younger had died in 1728 and didn't live to see the finished building. But his influence over the new royal palace was clear for all to see. Tassin the Younger actually designed the palace to a really intricate way of symbolizing power. You have four facades, and every facade has a symbol or meaning, which you have the male and the female on the west and the eastern side. The aesthetic of the king's western facade was quite kind of practical and businesslike because that was the part of the palace from which um, the king was actually carrying out his ruling duties. Whereas the eastern facade, which was representing the queen, got its inspiration more from emotions like love and compassion. And on the north, you have the nation as a power, and on the south, you have the power as being triumphant in battle. So you have like four sides of each individual character of the, of the nation. Tassin's connective design trait continued inside the new south wing of the palace. Nicodemus Tassin the Younger was quite clever when he not only juxtaposed the male and the female side, to also juxtapose the church and the state. So in the east you have the church and the ecclesiastical power, and to the west you have the whole of state and the throne as a symbol of the secularized power. So the whole structure of the building is supportive of the whole community, how it was perceived at that time. The decoration of the interiors, the lavish paintwork and gilding was important, but so was the layout of the building. The chapel and the throne room are deliberately designed to be visually connected, so that it is obvious that the instructions from God are being transmitted directly to the throne. When you're standing in the Hall of State, when you're standing in front of the throne chair, it's about 100 meters between the throne chair and the altar in the Royal Chapel. It's an amazing view. I can assume when uh, people were entering the Hall of State, perhaps they could look over their shoulder and see the altar in the chapel, and then they would understand that the king had divine power. Both the chapel and the Hall of State were adapted from Tassin's original plans by local architect Carl Holloman. He modified the designs to make the rooms more fashionable. The significance of the Hall of State is that it's really a good example of a style that is transitional. Nicholas de Sin the Younger actually draws a Hall of State which is in a Baroque style. But through the time when they constructed the palace, the Hall of State transcides and becomes a Rococo place. So the sculptures are on the Cornish uh, level, more sitting on the level and not actually carrying the ceiling, which actually symbolizes the transition really well in the sense that you don't have a Baroque space. It transcends into a Rococo space, which is much more open and light in scheme. The difference between Baroque and Rococo is a complicated thing, of course. There's every difference between one style and another. Rococo is, in many ways, less pretentious. You don't look for the grand effects, you look for something more intimate. You look for lighter colors often, a little bit more informal than the Baroque who loved state rooms, state occasions, and was always symmetrical. The magnificent Hall of State takes up two floors of the palace and was home to the Riksdag, the Swedish parliament, for over a hundred years. Until 1974, though, the opening of the parliament in January each year took place in this Hall of State, with the king still sitting in the silver throne in front of us. 
the silver throne that is, of course, the most important object in this Hall of State, made in 1650 in Augsburg, Bavaria, Germany, and a gift that time from one of the most powerful men in Sweden, Magnus Gabriel Lagardi, and a gift to the Swedish Queen Christina at that time, and supposed to be used during the coronation ceremony for us. And so it was, and ever since then, this throne chair has been the throne chair of Sweden. Many kings and queens of Sweden have overseen legislature in the Hall of State, and it is still used for royal engagements to this day. For example, in 1973, this is the hall where our present king, Carl Gustav, became the king officially. And in 2010, when Crown Princess Victoria married uh, Prince Daniel, this is where the wedding dinner party took place for approximately 350 guests. The king who inherited the Hall of State at the Royal Palace of Stockholm was Gustav III, who was crowned in May 1772. The progressive ruler had ascended to the throne the previous year. Gustav III was a great man of culture. He loved art, he loved the opera, he loved music. He said that he thought the Swedish language was better when it was sung. The cultured king made many alterations to the look of the palace. Every generation of royalties living here have made changes. I mean, this is a home. We might not think of a palace as a home, but it was home to the royal family. And just as we don't move into the home of our grandparents uh, without making changes. Uh, it was the same for the royal family. Every generation made their contributions to the palace, their changes. So when Gustav III becomes king in 1771, the actual style is changing from the Rococo into some sort of like early neoclassical style. They have the grotesque paintings uh, on the walls, and uh, you can see Pompeii, the lost city, was actually discovered during the 17th century and inspired a lot of architects to do the same. So it's actually an Italian Roman style, which is high in its uh, fashion at the time. Gustav wanted Sweden to return to an absolute monarchy, meaning the king would have power over parliament. In 1772, he plotted to overthrow the Riksdag. One year after his accession to the throne, he staged a coup. So that's when he uses their assembly in the Hall of State here in the palace, simply to get in front of the parliament to tell them that the nation is threatened, we need a strong rule, and I'm to take the region out of the situation. And then they locked the door. He went out and left them there to discuss whatever should be done. And they, they in the end, realized that there was a very, not very much else to do than to say yes. After ruling as the most powerful king in Sweden since the disastrous Great Northern War of 1700 to 1721, Gustav III felt the nation had grown strong enough to take on their biggest neighbor to the east, Russia. He started a war in 1788 against his cousin, Catherine the Great of Russia. And uh, well, this was not good because to have a war, it costed a lot of money. And a lot of people thought that he had spent a little bit too much money first on the culture on the education system and also on this war. In 1790, the unpopular and expensive Russo-Swedish war ended in a stalemate. The patience of the Stockholm aristocracy had run out. Gustav could not have met a more dramatic end. He was assassinated at a masked ball in the Royal Opera House at Stockholm. There was certainly a senior officer who knew there was a plot against him, who warned him, he took no notice. He trusted in his mask and he was shot in the back with a pistol by a disgruntled nobleman, Captain Johann Jakob Ankerström. And he thought it's only a scratch. Unfortunately, 
The scratch turned out to be a fatal wound, and unexpectedly he died. His last words were, I think I will feel better for a little sleep. And he never woke up. That kind of assassination had never taken place in Sweden. They considered him to be a tyrant, and just as in 18th century theory, Brutus was entitled to kill Caesar. When Caesar's uh, political ambitions became too big for the country, the murder of a tyrant was an acceptable act. They were apprehended rather quickly. Ankerström, who fired the shot, was beheaded, but he was the only one. The other ones were exiled. So it was a rather surprisingly uh, lenient treatment of, of the members of the plot. Gustav III died in his bed at the Royal Palace of Stockholm on the 29th of March, 1792. He was succeeded by his son, Gustav Adolf, but the new king came to power at a pivotal time in European history. Gustav Adolphus IV had a quite hard time when he became of age and started to rule the country by himself. Well, I do have to say that this is the early 1800s. This was during the Napoleon Wars. So it was troubled times in entire Europe. So it was not easy for him to govern the country. We lost Finland in 1808, not to Napoleon, but to Napoleon's ally, Russia. And in spring 1809, when the king still wanted to go on with the war, there was a coup. Some officers went up into the king's quarters here in the palace and simply told him that he was deposed. Due to his inept leadership during the catastrophic Finnish war, the Riksdag forced Gustav Adolf to abdicate in favor of his uncle in 1809. But Charles XIII was 60 years old with no legitimate heirs. Thus began the search for a new dynasty. Charles first adopted Danish Prince Christian August to be the heir presumptive, but he died just a few months later in May 1810. This led the Swedish government to look towards their great adversary for a future ruler. One nobleman appealed to Jean-Baptiste Jules Bernadotte, a Frenchman, a great French military officer, to come and be the king. Now, this man was really very linked with Napoleon. Essentially, he had married Napoleon's ex-girlfriend, Desiree Clary. So he was Napoleon's right-hand man. He was very close to Napoleon. Napoleon was always very close to Desiree. In fact, Napoleon's brother married Desiree's sister, so it was all very close. It was hoped that Bernadotte could bring a new age of prosperity to Sweden after its defeat to Russia in the Finnish War of 1808. At that point in 1810, it looked like an eventual French hegemony in Europe. Napoleon seemed to be uh, invincible. A good French field marshal might actually be able to get Finland back, Finland that we'd lost only two years earlier. Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte was adopted by King Charles XIII, and the Frenchman became the Crown Prince of Sweden. Before arriving at the Royal Palace of Stockholm in November 1810, a portrait was commissioned. The portrait we see here was painted by François Chirard, and it's a state portrait of the first Bernadotte, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte, who, as a king, called himself Carl XIV, Johan of Sweden and Norway. He had never been to Sweden, the portrait was painted in Paris before we left for Sweden, the very first time we would set foot on Swedish land. While heir to the Swedish throne, Bernadotte resided in the Royal Palace of Stockholm and took control of the government. He became a major strategical power in the army of his adopted nation. Bernadotte was well received when he arrived. He was obviously a powerful man and regarded as uh, a hope for the future. To the big surprise of the Swedes, he sided with Napoleon's adversaries. 
Napoleon may have thought that Bernadotte would be his puppet, but that wasn't the case. Bernadotte renounced Catholicism and became completely Swedish and actually chose what was best for Sweden. And as Napoleon began to fall, he really became one of those who was pushing against him. So the big plan to defeat Napoleon, it was discussed in a Polish castle where the leaders, the Austrians, the Russians, Bernadotte and the English, and it was decided already in 1812 that Napoleon should be driven to the vicinity of Leipzig and somewhere around Leipzig should be a decisive battle. And the Battle of Leipzig is the big thing. And that strategy was what Bernadotte proposed to the Allies. It was his plan. After helping to defeat his old ally, Napoleon, Jean-Baptiste Bernadotte was crowned King Charles XIV, John of Sweden, in 1818. A gallery at the palace is named after the great leader. Since then, we have not been in war, because he made um, a foundation for Sweden in a way that we have been a neutral country and we had been living in very good ways. Another thing is, of course, that he was founder of the dynasty, which still is on the Swedish throne. And he's also, in many ways, a kind of legendary person who comes from France and becomes actually a very competent ruler. King Charles XIV John ruled Sweden for 26 years. His son, Oscar I, ascended to the throne in 1844. The new king asked Swedish architect Per Axel Nyström to update the Royal Palace of Stockholm. One of his creations, completed in 1850, was the White Sea Ballroom. We have several explanations why we call it the White Sea. Something obviously is the white marble stucco that are covering these walls. And another reason for the name is that it's sometimes rather cold here in this room. It's like the White Sea. But this was made to be the ballroom. So you should not sit and down and be lazy here in this room. You should dance instead. The ballroom is on the second floor in the northeast corner of the Royal Palace. Nystrom knocked down an adjoining wall to create the space. If you see over there, you can see a soldier's head up in the decoration. This room were two rooms. The area up here belonged to the queen, and it was the queen's dining room. The other room was a room for her corpse de guards. But when this was made into a ballroom in the 1850s, they did not take away the soldier's head. They were gilded instead. So that is quite interesting. The White Sea Ballroom is still used when Sweden's modern royals are hosting dignitaries. The current King of Sweden, Karl XVI Gustav, has been on the throne since 1973. The royal family is extremely popular. It's measured every year by some, some sort of poll. And the confidence in the king and the queen are always rates extremely high. So they are personally popular and uh, regarded as uh, great, great assets to the, to the nation. The monarchy is in good shape. The future heir to the throne, Princess Victoria, is a wonderful woman. The Crown Princess, she got married in 2010, and that was extraordinary. I mean, there were thousands of people outside the palace. I think they counted about 500,000 people on Stockholm that day. That was extraordinary. And then they had a dinner in the whole state, and after that, they were waltzing up in, in the apartments. The state apartments where Princess Victoria celebrated her wedding are still used when heads of state from around the world visit the Royal Palace of Stockholm. State visit nowadays usually lasts three days. It could be shorter, it could be longer, but approximately three days. 
And during that stay, this apartment is uh, the home of the visiting president, king, or queen coming here. Quite recently, also, the Prince of Wales and the Duchess of Cornwall stayed here. And I also would like to mention that Queen Elizabeth stayed here in 1956 for the first time, and then also back in 1983. As well as the classic decor on show around the palace, one location exhibits Sweden's modern style. The Jubilee Room was designed for the king in 1998 to celebrate his 25 years on the throne. When we have heads of states and ambassadors uh, coming to visit the royal family, we also want to show them something which is contemporary. So it was really important for the royal palace to have that kind of story to add on to the actual storyline of the whole palace. The royal palace, under the stewardship of King Carl XVI Gustav, continues to modernize. Every Swedish king has to choose a motto by themselves. And our present king, he chose for Sweden with the times to show that he wanted to be a modern king, he wanted to be contemporary, he wanted to be part of daily life in Sweden. The king has a great interest in keeping the building from an environmental view. So we've had some thoughts of how we can meet that. And in the end, we this summer inaugurated a solar panel plant on the roof of the Royal Palace. And it's about a thousand square meters of solar panels. The mix of the new and the old make the Royal Palace of Stockholm a fascinating place. It will host many future royals, yet remains a reminder of Sweden's compelling past. I think that the palace as the creation of Tessin, the architect, is really the most impressive thing, how this building still manages to dominate central Stockholm not through loud architecture that uh, yells to everyone, but having a character and a sort of a aesthetic backbone of its own. And that, I think, is impressive. Through these rooms, you've always had something that we call the tree rings. So you have different added tree rings that show that the actual interiors have evolved through time. So long was the construction's period that what had originally been a medieval castle, which of course has gone, to the Baroque of the late 17th century, through the Rococo to the Neoclassical at the end. But we also have interior spaces today that are added in a modern flavor. So it gives you sort of like a circular aspect of the palace in a constant evolution through time. Although it's the official residence of the king, the Royal Palace of Stockholm can still be visited by tourists, and almost half a million people per year flock to Sweden to bask in the wonder of one of the most opulent palaces in Europe. For the king today, it's really important to make people feel welcome to the Royal Palace. That's also one of the reasons why we keep uh, so many different parts of the palace open to the public. So it's really important for Sweden as a whole to show itself as an open country where we can invite people to come. The palace is still key to the royal family in Sweden. It's something that every Swedish person sees. The royal family have a very important role as constitutional monarchs. They are much loved in Sweden, much supported, much talked about. And the palace really is at the center of constitutional and political life.